This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Larry Keeley, who is um, the co founder of Doblin, which is a design and strategy consulting firm, now part of uh, Deloitte, uh, also an adjunct professor at uh, IIT, uh, Institute of Design, not the one in India, the one in Chicago. And, uh, and also has taught at Kellogg and other universities, uh, as an independent scientist at this point, uh, doing research in design and innovation, and also the author, co-author of this book right here, 10 Types of Innovation. Welcome, Larry. Thanks, Greg. Really a pleasure to be on On Siloed. Now... When I mentioned you were a scientist, I hesitated for a second because I was, I was trying to figure out, wait, wh what kind of scientist are you? And it, it occurred to me that you're, you're really an innovation scientist. I, and I don't know if there's actually a term for this, right? Because we don't think about innovation as a science. We think about, you know, there's, there's innovation in biology. There's, there's innovation in manufacturing. There's innovation in, in business models. Um, but we don't think of innovation itself as kind of something that you can study or, or something that you can, can master. And I, and I think that part of your intent in writing this book right here, 10 types of innovation is to make the case that, that innovation is, is a discipline. And by discipline, you mean not only something you can study, but something that you can, you can learn and, and master and that innovation uh, is in many ways domain neutral. In other words, if you're good at, at innovation in, in one area, that, that may make you more likely to be a good innovator in, in another area. And, and I should mention that at the very beginning of the book, you, you emphasize that if you're going to be an innovation scientist, it's going to require that you understand a bit of um, economics and, and a bit of, uh, of, of, of design and, and a bit of, you know, humanities, sciences, social sciences, you know, it's, it's a very interdisciplinary science. So is it, is it fair to describe you as an innovation scientist? It's exactly correct. And part of where that comes from, Greg, is the widespread myth that innovation is fundamentally about creativity. Um, mm -hmm. This turns out to be one of the most pervasive myths about innovation. And one of the very first things we did as part of our science discipline was to try to identify the most common beliefs about innovation and then rigorously and systematically evaluate those to see if they had any truth at the core. And if so, was that changing in any way in the modern era when we're fundamentally about interconnectedness and when there are huge transformational shifts in the field of innovation so that it's fundamentally less and less about the primary invention of something new and much more about the elegant integration of many things that are already known. So treating it with the skepticism of a scientist and with the discipline and the methodology of science in order to determine what works and what doesn't led to the invention of an entirely new field called innovation effectiveness, where instead of just being vaguely in favor of innovation, you're sort of obsessive about paying attention to the ratio of the innovation initiatives you're pursuing, how many of them return your cost of capital, how many of them fail to return your cost of capital. That ushered in a huge new array of methodologies. As I like to say it, Greg, a great Modern innovator should be familiar with 70 or 80 innovation methods, should be world-class good at a dozen and potentially the primogenitor of one or two. Well, you mentioned things like ROI and, and innovation in, in the same sentence. And, you know, I, I don't think that's the way we, we normally think about innovation, right? right. Um, whether you're in a business school, whether you're in a company or even in a consulting firm, you know, innovation is kind of this thing that's, that's grafted onto all the other stuff, right? So you learn your economics, you learn your accounting, you learn your finance, and then, oh, we're going to add on innovation. Um, we we at, at Berkeley Haas, we, we in, introduced this elective called design thinking um, a couple of years back. And, and it, it kind of never, it, w it was like a foreign object that, that never really completely got um, 
absorbed. You know, the, the immune system kind of rejected it in, in, in some ways. Um, and, and of course, design thinking is, is not quite the same thing as what you're talking about. I think you're, you're going to argue that, that when we think about one of the reasons why it, it kind of, the host rejects it is precisely because it's, it's, it's not, um, carefully integrated with these, these other concerns that, that business people have. So is, 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 is innovation the way people talk about it? Um, you know, it's so abstract and unrealistic and, and, uh, and, and, you know, artificial that it, it simply is not relevant for people who are practitioners on the ground. Is that the problem? Well, certainly there are many and varied problems and how people use the term, what they mean by the term, what they think the scarce resource is in pursuing it. All great disciplines, Greg, as you know, have uh, three component parts to the profession. There's history, there's criticism, and there's theory, right? There's the history of how have we done it in the past? There's criticism, the ability to bring data and discipline and robustness to the analytics about what isn't working well, what needs to be improved. And then there's theory about how you go about changing that. Um, you've mentioned design thinking, which I consider to be an utterly trivial and brittle um, non-discipline, but it sounds really cool and it's been wildly popular the world over and it's easily integrated into a curriculum with a, an elective or two. So it doesn't really stress out your average business school, engineering school, etc. But it has no legs. It doesn't really produce robust routine and reliable results. And therefore, any good scientist should quickly say, okay, it's just a, it's just a series of talking points. It's a, it's a semantic transformation of the topic that does in no way make designers better at innovation or non-designers better at design. Um, indeed, even internally as a term, it's a little bit flawed because the very best designers are doing something quite different from thinking. Um, they're really acting in a series of ways that are mostly about prototyping rapidly and then trying to determine whether or not any of the things they came up with are working reliably with the actual users and what unintended consequences mm -hmm. come along. Calling that design thinking is a misnomer of a variety of types, right? So look, what I'm trying to just be is more precise and in the zeal to bring robustness and precision to a topic as vitally important as innovation, what I hope to do is to root out myths and substitute methods and the evidence, Greg, that this is real is now quite abundant. If you talked about the fact that I've already am using a metric in order to determine whether or not a particular innovation initiative is worthwhile. And I spent maybe seven years trying to figure out the accounting and the analytics for success versus mm -hmm. failure in innovation. Nothing simpler than, or more elegant than the idea that an, an individual initiative returns the cost of capital to the firm that, mm -hmm. or the government or the philanthropy that's trying something new. That's very different from the hope in Silicon Valley, for instance, that you'll get uh, a massive runaway winner like a Google or a Facebook or a Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to a gazillion engineers and trained some of the best ones. And they are the first to say, I really don't mind if I have a lot of failures, if my handful of successes are so wildly successful that it, mm -hmm. you know, pays for all my sins. And, and here's what I know. I know that if you don't even measure the number of your initiatives that return the cost of capital, you tend to reinforce the sloppy habits that don't work very well. The minute you start paying attention to which initiatives return the cost of capital and which do not, which by the way, is fairly complicated accounting, which we could double click on if that's of interest to you. 
Um, then you're in a position to say, wow, certain things help me to reliably get better outcomes and all good, uh, modern professionals and especially all great engineers should appreciate efficiency in that respect, right? They should like to not waste their time with things that don't work reliably. And that's why I think it's so cool to bring the modern discipline of science to a topic as abstract, frankly, as foggy, as, uh, imprecise and as, um, uh, sloppily used as innovation in the vast majority of cases, I find in innovation to be a vague hope, a kind of salve that uh, inside of companies, strategic planners use as the mythical, you know, sort of, uh, fudge factor. If, uh, if I get mm -hmm. filthy stinking rich, when I get this level of top line, sorry, from your direction, this level of top line growth, but my current performance at this level, well, we're closing that gap, Greg is going to be done with innovation, right? And all of a sudden I've got mm -hmm. a wild, uh, enthusiasm for innovation because it's going to close the gap in my target revenues. Underneath that vague hope comes any number of silly actions that almost never produce the results people expect at the time they expect. Mm -hmm. I think it's really cool to bring well, I th the robustness and the analytics to it. Well, so I've talked to a lot of people on the show about innovation. And, you know, one of the things that always comes up is that, you know, organizations, they have an existing routine. They have existing metrics that are optimized for a business that is not terribly innovative, right? This is sort of the, you know, exploit side of the business. Mm -hmm. And, and those, those metrics and those processes and those procedures generally asphyxiate innovation. And so often the, the proposal that companies embrace is this idea of setting aside a completely separate side of the organization, which will, uh, encourage exploration. And, and, and sometimes they'll even embrace this idea. Well, if let's just throw out metrics, let's just dispose of rigor. Let's, let's get rid of all the stuff that we see as constraining us and, and create this, this playground where, where people can, you know, have a lot of fun and, uh, you know, throw up the post-it notes and, uh, and, and think freely, um, and then just take, you know, wild uh, crazy bets. And, and I think that that fundamentally, you know, misunderstands what kind of venture capitalists do, uh, because, you know, they can be quite, quite rigorous and, and ruthless when it comes mm -hmm. to, um, you know, killing, uh, companies that have failed to, to reach their, their milestones. So do you think that, that corporations that have these initiatives that they, they, they fail to understand, right. How, how rigorous, things really are out in, you know, the world of, of venture capital, for instance? Well, let's, let's tackle both parts of your observation, which is, which is excellent and important. Okay. The first observation you're making is that a whole bunch of companies eager to show their support for innovation, engage in innovation theater, they'll create entirely new units that are focused on innovation. They'll often move them into some place like Silicon Valley. They'll spend a fortune on the facilities. They'll festoon the place with, you know, really cool lamps and, and bean bags and whiteboards and all the trappings of innovation. Um, or they'll even rent a special place, uh, in, uh, we work, or as I like to call it, we used to work. Um, uh, as a way of showing how very <laughs> hip and, and, you know, with it, they are. You've also asserted that venture capitalists bring greater discipline, which is true up to a point, but I'm going to risk offending you, Greg, um, and your listeners by saying, I don't think there's anywhere close to enough robustness and methodology in most venture capital firms in terms of what they could be doing and should be doing to, to, uh, deeply analyze innovation ideas, what they do have as a virtue, uh, something that I've studied for now four decades is that they have a great way of listening to the pastiche 
of ongoing activities in a young startup firm, very often a firm that is undisciplined. So you give $37 million to a 28 year old. And I don't think it would surprise you, Greg, to know that that 28 year old is just kind of tingly all over and starts to have a great sense of enthusiasm about the 73 different things that need to be done. And so they get, you know, venture capitalist comes every other Friday to listen to progress. And the young 28 year old is going on and on. Oh, look at our great new logo. And we're working on the, on the, you know, capital raise. And we've got this fantastic way that we're doing, uh, you know, the algorithm and we've got a new way to plug in Stripe. That's going to give us global transaction efficiency. And we're really pumped about the new pitch deck and we're having a little problem with the sorting algorithm, um, uh, but you know, Joe's on it and Joe's really good. And so they go down this long list of things and the venture capitalist will listen to the enthusiasm, discount 90% of everything he or she is listening to. And so, you know, you mentioned this one little problem that Joe's working on. I'm coming back next Tuesday. We're going to spend an hour and a half on that. That's all we're going to talk about. Joe needs to be in the room and I want his entire team there. And if they conclude that whatever that gnarly problem is cannot be solved by the team and they whack everything and they drop the funding. They're just ruthless about saying no, because what they pay attention to is the opposite of what people do in big established companies, Greg, the cliche in big companies, you know, whenever you bring Mr. or Ms. Big into the innovation unit is the design team, the engineering team will be really pumped about the big presentation. They've been getting ready for it for two months and they finally got their audience and they're, and they and they present this really speculative set of possibilities, beautifully packaged, brilliantly designed, slickly, you know, um, uh, transformed into a set of possibilities. And what they're saying is you know, all we need is X, Y, Z amount of capital, $11 million. And then we're off to the races and we're ready to run through sheer brick walls to make sure this works. No worries. That senior executive in an established company will nearly always trot out the, you know, cliche number one in big companies, which goes, this is really great. I'm really impressed. I love the excitement on the team. Just what we were looking for when we funded an innovation capability. I just want to know, you know, of all these things that you've shared with me today, what's the low hanging fruit? What is it that we could do differently <laughs> on Monday that would just be utterly transformational? I, and I really want us to focus on that. See, that's, mm. that's what you do if you're in an established firm, as you said, trapped in its business models, mm -hmm. trapped in its metrics and trapped in its current channels. In a venture capital firm, they listen for the opposite. They don't listen for the low hanging fruit. They listen for the hardest bit you have to get right. And then they're relentless and driven mm -hmm. about trying to determine whether or not that hard bit you have to get right is in fact going to be cracked by this team or not. If it isn't going to be cracked by this team, the first thing they do is they change the team. And if they can't find a team that can crack it, then they kill it. And that is great. That's how you focus on something that's a true breakthrough. But you see the difference between the default setting and a big established company, mm -hmm. what's the low hanging fruit? What do I do to improve the known versus a venture capital firm? Uh, what's the hardest bit I have to get right in order to create something truly new and noteworthy. Those two basic default settings are remarkably, uh, incompatible with one another. Number one, and number two, just different ways to listen mm -hmm. and different ways to act. Well, are there, are there comparative advantages for the, for the, those two different approaches? I mean, you spend, um, a significant amount of your time working with, with large companies, right? I mean, when you're at a global consulting firm, it, it's not the, you know, the series A companies that are, are coming to you and, and asking for, for advice, right? They, they go to the, the, the venture capitalists. So, um, when you're dealing with these large companies, I mean, what are the, the comparative advantages that, that they bring to the table with this, this process and, and, and routine? Are there specific types of, of innovation for which they are, are better suited? Um, because every large company has sort of startup envy, right? You know, they, they, 
they, they say they wish they could all be more like, like, like startups. Uh, well, at the same time, you know, startups look o- across the way and they, they sometimes have big company envy well, that, in, in, in some ways. So well, what's, that's, first what's off, that's a advantage? great topic. And if you and I were with your class right now, I would say, okay, everybody show of hands, what's more innovative, big companies or little companies. And so you tell me, you teach an awful lot of talented, uh, graduate students. If I said, how many of you think big companies are more innovative than little companies? What percentage of the hands would go up? Okay. And if I said, how many of you think little companies are more innovative than big companies? Okay. So here's the right answer. Again, this is so important, Greg. This is why I like to call myself an innovation scientist. These kinds of bullshit answers to bullshit questions need to be rooted out and understood with greater precision. The right answer, the technically correct answer is that it's an unfair question. And the reason is that for every big company, Mm -hmm. there's 64,000 little companies. And we only hear about this comparative handful that become Airbnb, Facebook, (laughs) you know, Apple and, and, uh, Amazon. And so the truth is pound for pound initiative for initiative, big companies are actually more innovative than little companies. They have more resources. They have more opportunities to do deals. They have more opportunities to fix relentlessly and repeatedly the things that are problematic. And surprisingly, Greg, this is a topic for another day. Within big companies, family-owned businesses are actually better than publicly traded businesses for other structural reasons, which we'll delineate on another day. The thing that's sort of interesting about this, I mean, Jack Welch himself recognizing at the tail end of his tenure that he had pretty much overlooked the internet and realizing that he was going to be creamed by history uh, because of that, created a very interesting initiative, didn't bother clearing it with anybody, talked about it only with his press secretary and announced on a particular Friday in the Wall Street Journal that he was funding the BetYourCompany.com initiative at General Electric and that every one of the um, uh, businesses at that time, I think there were about 130 businesses of General Electric had to, in 90 days, show up with their DestroyYourBusiness.com plan um, that would, you know, mm-hmm. change the way they worked. And Jack, to me, when I asked him about this, called it Revenge of the Big Coast. We're going to come in, learn what these startups have done mm-hmm. and just getting good at it and good at it at scale. For six years, I was one of only two people allowed to teach innovation at General Electric. Same at Citigroup and at Mayo Clinic and a variety of other places. So you're right. I've served an awful lot of big companies, but I've also built the innovation systems for little companies and philanthropies and governments. And what I can tell you is that the errors are everywhere. That when you learn to uh, get rid of the, uh, the lore and substitute logic, you start to s- s- build in the methods and metrics that matter. And just to give you a baseline so that we understand mm-hmm. the norms across all industries and all geographies. And, you know, Doblin was the first firm in the history of the world to do this work. We discovered that innovation tends to return the cost of capital about four and a half times out of every hundred. That means for every hundred initiatives, four or five will return the cost of capital, which is roughly where medicine was, Greg, when is where the most promising treatment of the day, Mm -hmm. right? For the last 18 years now, the worst we've been able to achieve when we plug in just what I call hygiene methods is a 35% success rate. That's a seven X improvement in global norms. Mm -hmm. The best we've been able to achieve is about an 82, 81% success rate, which is a 20 X improvement over global norms. That's my evidence that innovation is giving up its secrets, that we can teach it to anybody and expect it from everybody. It's also important, Greg, to see that as 
the beginnings of a new specialization inside of the field of innovation. And it really doesn't matter whether you're trying to adapt it for the special focus of a venture capitalist, whether you're looking for angel type investing or, you know, the uh, alpha series, um, you can create a special flavor of methodologies for any of those uh, kinds of interventions. You can also do it, and I have done it, for big companies or for little companies or for companies that are uh, going through a variety of, of contextual situations. Um, I've just been acquired. Uh, we've just had a, a, a change of CEO. There's been a hostile takeover. There's been a uh, consolidation in my industry. All of those things should lead to disciplined innovation adjustments and rarely do. Mm -hmm. And so what is the secret? I mean, I think, you know, when I talk about it in, in my classes, I, I talk about kind of, you know, de-risking it or, you know, accelerating the arrival of, you know, relevant information that allows you to you know, validate your hypothesis, which is kind of, yep. you know, it's the kind of lean startup approach. Um, and in, in your book, you know, you, you, you talk about that, how, you know, you go from uh, a, a world of high uncertainty to one where kind of the uncertainty has been uh, reduced. And this comes from actually kind of getting product out and in the hands of, of potential customers is, is this kind of lean approach? No. Uh, the, the secret that has been, um, it's kind of developed over the last Eric 20 years, Reese, the author of Lean there, Startup there was the it. only other guy allowed to teach innovation at General Electric besides me. So, um, and his signature advance is minimum viable product. Um, so here's what, what I want to salute you for. When you say to your students, you want to de-risk innovation, huge topic and absolutely 100% true. A mysterious topic that most people go about in almost a, entirely the wrong ways, but it is the right goal. Okay. De-risking innovation is a big deal. And most of my science has been based by treating information forensically. Okay. Same thing that happens in hospitals. Usually in Western world, every Wednesday, do you know how those work? All the hospital staff get together. They don't let, yeah, but they don't let the lawyers show up. Postmortems. And they have real conversations with each other. And they mm -hmm. ask the question, like, who died last week and why? And are we seeing anything new? And underneath that is a really solid value system that basically says we didn't want them to die. We, we all used up all the equipment we got laying around and everybody did the best we know how. Let's have a after action, non-judgmental review of what happened. That's what a forensic analysis is that steadily improves medicine as we know it and particularly helps to detect when some new infection is plaguing us in our institution. Um, as you can imagine, that's a recently important topic, Greg. Very few things happen like that in the world of innovation. Mm -hmm. In the world of innovation, what tends to happen instead is when there's a failure, people work very hard to scrub it from their CVs as swiftly as possible. They treat it like the Soviet Union treats mm -hmm. history, right? It just didn't happen. And, and that is stupid and toxic. When instead you learn to say, why did that failure happen? Have we ever seen that pattern of failure before? And what's the trade craft that we would use to prevent that failure in the future? And the first thing I try to teach my design students is to always have a meta level of process clicking in their heads. I'm solving problem X. When in the course of human events has anyone ever solved a problem like problem X in history? What were the failures that people had on route to solving problem X, what were the occasional successes? What was different about the successes? What are the principles that I might adapt? That is the de-risking that actually works. But back to your hope that the data will arrive at the right moment. That is one of the promises of design thinking that you'll, you'll install just enough feedback loops so that you can know when to prototype a little bit further. And that is the one piece of design thinking that approximates 
something like a discipline. For Eric Ries and Lean Startup and the idea that Lean is the answer, I want to tell you that Agile and Lean matter only when you are trapped in a world where your number one requirement is velocity, okay? And there are many industries like that. You want to compete against Amazon, mm -hmm. you better have a really good clock speed, okay? Um, and you want to do anything in the world of trading, as we all know, velocity is managed down to the picosecond. And, um, wait, are you going to say there's some, are you going to say there's some industries now where, where velocity I'm going to tell is, you is, is an is extremely not, important uh, principle is important when you're innovating on the same basis as all of your competitors, velocity is always important. If you're going to change the basis for competitive, uh, uh, action then depth is important in having fresher insights about what to do differently and how to do it differently matters more. Historically, Greg, there's always been at least two flavors or what I like to call two ambitions for innovation. Improving the known business is nearly always a velocity game. Inventing a completely new business is usually about, mm -hmm. well, the Clay Christensen term was disruptive innovation. When I got to teach with him, we would talk about that a lot. And he and his charming, gracious, unbelievably professional way would say, well, gee, Larry, I'm kind of sorry I called it disruptive innovation because it sounds like a bad thing. And that because of that, people don't really want to do it, but they should want to do it because it's actually a good thing. And unfortunately, disruptive is the right technical term because it really does disrupt things. But unfortunately, even including the operations of the company that we're trying to do it for, and that's upsetting to them. So I kind of wish I hadn't called it. And I'd say, Clay, let's just relax about this. Why don't we call one thing simple innovation, <laughs> which Greg is characterized by four fewer types of innovation. And the other thing, what I like to call mm -hmm. sophisticated innovation characterized by five or more types of innovation. And until very recently, you could do the disruptive innovation more slowly and more deliberately. It wasn't mostly about velocity, but if you are inside of a contested industry and everybody's moving to try to get market share, then velocity is almost always the thing you want to optimize around. And that's where you know, lean plays a role. That's where agile mm -hmm. plays a role. And that's where very rapid prototyping and feedback loops and ideally things that are split tested and moving at light speed, which is something that Amazon does relentlessly and routinely. Right. Um, there is a brand new field, which mm -hmm. hopefully you and I will find time to talk about called integrated design, where I have for the first time ever resolved the velocity, um, and complexity trade-off and found methods that work for doing both simultaneously. For good news, most people don't need that. Well, in, in strategy, we talk about the learning curve and, and we talk about how, you know, the more you do something kind of the, the better you, you get at it. But it seems like when it comes to you know, innovation, um, it's almost like organizations have these, you know, telomeres that kind of run out at some point, right? And, 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 and it's almost like, you know, learning is a stage that, that, that organizations go through. And then once they've kind of hit on the, the thing that, that, that works, then the learning kind of uh, is discouraged. Um, is, is there a way that you can, you know, get better at learning? Uh, is there a way that you can learn to learn? both as, as an organization and, and as an individual yeah. so that your I, capacity for learning continues to get better and better. Curiosity and your ability to get peripheral vision. So one of the most important things that I sometimes install for companies that really want to get great at innovation and dramatically increase their hit rate, especially around complex ideas and truly new ideas is I like to build immersion environments for them. And immersion environments should be differently mediated. And it is not at all about innovation theater. It's not about post-it notes and whiteboards. But I have a signature design for an immersion environment. And I think if you're trying to solve something truly new, you want to know about the applied frontiers of, of uh, crypto and the applied frontiers of quantum computing. 
you're being reckless if you do not build an immersion environment about that. So what's an immersion environment? It, it has, um, no windows. It's fairly large scale. It never makes the stupid mistake in old orthodoxy of having only one projector that you use to present the things that are going to go on in that room. A typical one might have six or eight, uh, which are used for special purposes. One wall, let's just call it, if we think of this as a rectangular box with long walls and short walls, the first long wall should have a dedicated projector that's just about the um, archive of what we've already done to learn about topic X, okay? And those can be thumbnail scale. But in my experience, Greg, anything sufficiently complicated has lots of team members that come and go. And as a result, almost no institutional memory of the problems we've already solved and the dimensions we've already thought about. So having a thumbnail scale mm -hmm. reminder of the pieces of work we've already done is quite crucial. Um, second portion of that big wall is about um, precursors. It's the parallels, the similar ideas that have happened in any industry and at any point in history, all distilled into disciplined little bite-sized nuggets that you can learn about quickly in a page or two. Uh, precursors are one of the most important ways to establish analogous thinking and, and the ability to reason mm -hmm. through something ambiguous, complicated, scary, where the stakes are high, time is short, and the uh, and the consequences of getting your choices wrong are catastrophic, okay? So filling the room with precursors is a beautiful thing. As we go around our room, one of the small walls should be used specifically for today's conversation, the piece of progress we're trying to make today. And that can have basically two things on it. One is the thematics, the the hypotheses we're trying to address that we're trying to get less stupid about. And the other is today's agenda, which I believe deserves its own dedicated projector. And it needs to have a vote function so that people can anonymously just put up a little red or green dot that basically says we're on target and the meeting is productive for me or it's not. And that's just very tiny, but it allows the whole room to have a feedback loop. The third wall, another big wall, should be about the work product of the conversation. And that's a, that might be a conversation like this, Greg. Remember when we did this piece of work like three months ago? I've revisited it. I think it's really important, especially in the context of these three pre precursors, which I really wasn't thinking about enough until now. Mm -hmm. If we take those two things together and look at that through the lens of today's thematic, which is uh, what could we do to, um, to create a, a, a crowd driven solution to a complicated problem that we don't know how to solve. My speculation is we could stitch that together into a function like this. And so you capture on that wall, people's constructive, uh, speculations and the logic train that they use to get there. And then the fourth and final wall is all about the action promises that we make to one another about what we're going to do to evaluate that guest by next time we meet together. And that is a freaking smart way to be curious and to be disciplined about that curiosity. So you said, you know, can we teach people to do better learning? I don't know. Universities seem to fail at that mostly routinely, don't you think? Um, but what you can do is you can install a bunch of protocols. I think if, if Doblin, the firm that I founded four decades ago, along with Mr. Doblin, who actually knew what he was doing, let's face it, I was the gopher. Um, uh, I think if we're ever recognized for anything, we're going to be recognized mostly for high protocol innovation, learning to break down the complicated tasks into constituent parts and pieces that we know how to defend. To be able to say, these are the things to do in this sequence in order to get the best outcomes. And here's why. And these are all the other things that people tend to do and the reasons not to do those things. 
I think high protocol innovation is one of the most glorious things that anybody trying to get good at this topic should become intensely focused upon. Well, it sounds like you're talking about designing a, a lab uh, or an environment for innovation. And, um, you know, universities are supposed to be, you know, labs in a way. And you've taught at a couple of different types of universities, right? You've been at, at a design school. You've, you've been at, at a business school. Um, are, are we really teaching people to be innovative? I know pretty much every business school has innovation somewhere in their, um, kind of in their marketing materials. And, and, and certainly, you know, when we think of design schools that, that at least most people now associate it with, you know, IDEO and, and creativity and, and innovation are, are, are educational institutions kind of, you know, fulfilling that role where we, where we teach people uh, you know, how to be innovative, how to be creative, how to learn. And then we send them out to the companies and, 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 you know, hope that we're infusing this energy into the companies or, or are we, uh, kind of crushing their souls and spirits, and you know, capacities like, uh, well, I hope those are in our only like, two uh, choices. Like let's, let's elementary just start school. by stipulating that's probably a false dichotomy that you've just given me. Here's what I think the best universities do. They're world-class good at accepting really great, talented individuals, individuals so talented that you and I and other faculty members could stand around and whack them with sticks for a couple of years. And we probably wouldn't harm too much their ability to succeed in life. Um, the very best universities also do a very good job of convincing the students that the work that they've taught them is in fact indispensable and the critical reason why they are successful in the hope that they will shower them with sweaty wads of cash as they get older and look for somebody to give their largesse to. Uh, that's a little cynical, but I think it's sadly true. What I think, especially in the three universities around the world that have brought me in to do their innovation, and ask them what they should be thinking about. Here's what I keep trying to do, Greg. Keep looking for what's different now and what would you do to change how this domain, this topic is mastered and practiced. Um, so for instance, recently I was privileged to work with the Dean of the new, brand new, just opened School of Medicine created in Oakland uh, for Kaiser Permanente, its first ever school of medicine. The work that we did to plan was two years ago. The brilliant Dean said to me, what do you think is different now? And she offered up many useful things. I want to give her the credit, um, that she deserves for having most of these insights, but ultimately she and I, in our conversation centered on two things. We said, medicine has always been taught until now as an individual topic where every scientist must, you know, every med, every medical doctor must master everything. This is nonsense. Like every other professional domain, the uh, increase in sophistication and complexity in medicine is at least geometric, possibly logarithmic. And that's why, you know, as you may know, IBM Watson became a medical doctor about four years ago, because it can read 20, thousand times as much stuff per day as the average doctor reads per year. Um, so the Dean of the school of medicine says, all right, we're going to teach it as a team sport, not an individual sport, not an individual practice that has huge consequences for the way you teach and practice medicine. And then her second orthodoxy that she challenged was, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to teach it as a data science. So every medical team trying to help a patient will be able to see the blinking, you know, feedback machines for that individual patient and her, uh, vitals and her, uh, performance condition right this second. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be another layer of data, Greg, that would be about patients like this from anywhere in the world that we might be able to learn from. And yet a third, which is patients in her neighborhood, mm -hmm. her her cultural norm, um, so that we're not missing something that might be, uh, culturally specific or, or population specific or regionally specific. 
And I just can't tell you how brilliant that is. And that's an example of innovating about education. Mm -hmm. What I don't think happens often enough is for people to systematically identify the orthodoxies in the way we teach. And what I think is critically important about the smart way you asked your question is you said, yeah. geez, what's going on? All business schools seem to offer up some design electives, just as all design schools seem to offer up some business electives. But when you really examine it from the vantage point of those deans, here's the orthodoxy they can't seem to break out of. People expect a market viable degree in two years. They don't want to study any longer than that. So how do you take the two years of intensive stuff that we need to teach a designer to not be random in the world of design and add it to the two years of things that we have to teach as fundamentals to a budding business, you know, administration student. And then for bonus points, add in the two years of essential things that we need to teach to a professional engineering student and do anything other than make a hash of it. Right. Um, and, and you just don't have enough curriculum real estate to cross teach all of those things. So the big question, one that I know you're really asking mm -hmm. and thinking about deeply, cause you and I've talked about this is what's the future school design. How would you get a combination of design and social science skills, engineering and technology skills, business, pricing, compliance, accounting, cash management, and financial skills, all to be resident in a team and to have that happen in efficient enough time so that the students don't rebel by having to go to school for six years. I think that's a really fun question. And I don't think people have come to what I would describe mm -hmm. as great market solutions for it yet. What I absolutely know does not work is to offer up a few sexy electives and then to pretend that we're teaching design schools to be good at innovation, uh, I mean, des designers to be good at business or business school kids good at design. I know that that is, I, I've been in the very best of mm -hmm. the schools that try to do that, all of them. And all I can see is that it's good packaging and extremely popular. You know, my courses at Kellogg were wildly popular, uh, always massive waiting lists. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, the designers that I spend years with will run circles in innovation around the brilliant, absolutely brilliant business school kids that do a great job mm -hmm. with the pricing models you know, and other, you know, functional requirements. Well, you have, you have a nice description of how kind of object oriented programming developed in the book as, as an innovation. And if, I'm wondering sure. if we could learn something uh, from that story, uh, when we think about education, right. And how we can, you know, design the, 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 the operating system that, that kind of everybody needs. And then, you know, how do we come up with these modular apps that people can, you know, assemble and which, you know, work well with different portfolios of apps that other individuals on the teams might possess. Um, you know, we may have, we may be able to learn something from these other, other industries. And I think in, in your book, you, you, you talk a lot about how you can learn by we looking around right. And, and trying to find things that are outside of your domain, right. Uh, learn from industries that, that are unlike your own industry, learn from companies that are doing tackling different, different problems and presumably learn from disciplines that are different, uh, from, from your own. Um, that's a difficult thing to do given the way everything is architected, right? So knowledge is architected in, in, you know, in buckets and, yeah. and silos and, and certainly functions within organizations are kind of organized in this way, presumably for accountability, for evaluation and, and so forth. Um, and so how do you, how do you Boy, overcome them without question, Greg. giving Thank up you for that. the reason um, why they exist in the first place? Really pointing to one of the 
pieces of essential tension where specialization really matters. It's the way we get depth. It's the way we get skills, but it's also the way we groove our habits that are then very ossified and difficult to break or to challenge or to, or to filigree around. And so what I try to do inside of a great innovation team is to compose it with enough different skills so that whatever we're encountering as the strongest, most robust resistance to the new inside of the enterprise we're trying to serve, whether that's a big company or a little company, a government or a philanthropy, I'm agnostic about that. But what you almost always discover is that there are points of friction where the organization is extremely certain of itself, uh, even if it's wrong and extremely robustly defensive about it. And that's where you have to bring a combination of wit and prototyping skills, storytelling skills, and I called it precursors. Um, you, you were talking about history or looking at any other industry or parallels, but some combination of those things can almost always get you to an extraordinary experience where at least you're talking about the sense of possibilities that people should be considering as something truly new. I think the thing that's interesting is that to a very large extent, companies think that what they should be doing with their innovation team is to, um, is to do it with a few creative folks and with a temporary level of junior folks brought in for their theatricality or for their, uh, or their creativity. And I think that that nearly always triggers the most common failure modes where innovation produces something that's sexy, but not robust, that doesn't really work in the world. And that mm -hmm. is fun during the meetings, but almost never gets implemented. And in the rare cases where it does get implemented, it tends to fail. Reinforcing, if you will, the company's toxic allergic reaction to the topic of innovation in the first place. Um, so how do you fix that? I think it's by bringing in a team that really understands that innovation is hard, um, that it's human. It pretends to be rational, Greg, but it really isn't. It's human at the core. The failures are literally always human failures. So bringing your empathy turns out to be indispensable and creating a way to help people to understand that we're all vaguely in favor of innovation in theory, but in practice, especially if we've been professionally trained and wildly successful for a long time, doing a few things exceptionally well, what we do as individuals inside of companies, large and small is try to return the world to what is familiar, what has worked for us in the past, what we're proud of. And what has been the driver of our successes, our profit pools mm -hmm. and our, and our brand strengths. People do that over and over and over again in ways large and small. And the great innovation team holds a mirror up to that and says, I completely recognize that this is your default setting. And I love that. In fact, we're going to jujitsu that in the following ways. We're going to use your strengths here, here, and here, but what we want you to be considering and to try to get comfortable with is this new behavior, which has not yet been a part of our default settings. We understand that that's scary. So we're going to test it in the following, you know, six ways, and we'll give you feedback loops and we'll give you practice testing it yourself. And we'll even take you to places in the world where that is the main thing that people do to succeed. So you can see the great organizations that have centered their be around this attribute we want you to become curious about and ultimately skilled at and maybe eventually world-class good at. And I think that that's one of the ways you help an organization 
with a lot of empathy to think about the hardest bits they have to get right as they try to innovate and do something unfamiliar. If you don't bring that kind of skill, which is an awful lot of anthropological elegance, uh, I've never been able to do it without humor. I've never been able to do it without great storytelling and great prototyping. If you don't have those skills, if mm-hmm. instead you think you're going to carry the day with a brilliant 40 page, um, um, Excel spreadsheet that shows what the cash flow is going to be in year seven for something the world has never seen before. Lots of people will thank you for your brilliant work, but those things hit the cutting room mm-hmm. floor, you know, 97 times out of a hundred. Well, I think we sometimes talk about companies and innovation as if the companies have to develop internal capabilities that allow them to do all these things kind of continuously. Um, but if, if companies did that, then, you know, where would consultants be? Right. I mean, you know, what what should we, I mean, consulting, I think the traditional view of consulting is kind of like, uh, you know, healthcare, right. You know, you get sick and so you go see the doctor and then the doctor patches you up and kind of sends you on your way. That's kind of the optimistic view. The, the pessimistic view is that, you know, CEO wants to sell something to his, you know, direct reports. And so he goes and pays for a, you know, uh, a, uh, a report that tells him what, you know, he wants to hear. Um, but, but either one of those approaches is sort of, um, suggesting that consultants are, um, selling up a product, right? Like a discrete report, a discrete deck, a discrete you know, set of ad- advisories. And then, you know, the cynical view of there is that, well, you, you, you know, like an auto mechanic, you got to loosen a few screws so that they come back to you, right? you know, uh, again and again, but, but, you know, why can't we think of, of consulting as, as like, a a, a, a service, you know, where, you know, we outsource all of our memory now to Google so we can focus on, um, you know, more interesting things to do with our brain. What, why can't companies kind of outsource, you know, major parts of, of, of the, of the management that they normally would do in-house to these companies like, like Deloitte, let's say. Um, and then the follow-up question is that, you know, now that consultant firms have all gone out and acquired, you know, design firms, doesn't that mean that they now have the, the full suite of capabilities that would enable okay, well, them to be kind of huge, the outsourced? You see. Uh, you know, tactic, sweet tactics questions. provider masquerading for, for as something simple when it's actually really about the field model. How is innovation changing? Where's the best place to situate it? Should I build an internal unit to do it? Should I get a, an out external unit to do it for me? Um, so I, Because after all, I mean, if innovation is a science, right, then, you know, it's, it's something that you can deploy in, 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 you know, multiple domains, you can step in and, and be the scientist to one company more and, and more to another people company will, and, I'm confident, um, come to see and, it and, that and, way you know, provide and we'll this learn scientific the best practices that make a difference. Um, but here's what has happened in the real world. Slowly, painstakingly. And not very consciously, the biggest firms in practice have learned that breakthroughs tend to be comprised of three constituent parts. There's the part of the breakthrough that has to do with the elegant use of some new capabilities, some technology. That's what's taught in the engineering schools, Greg. There's the part of the breakthrough that has to do with sources and uses of funds with the right degree of networking, with clouds, crowds, partners, and prizes, with operations, with uh, cash flow, uh, pricing models, distribution strategies, partnering strategies. That's what's taught in the better business schools. And the third part is, especially in any contested industry, the degree to which my offer is just cooler than, sexier than, easier to use than, more fun to use than, hipper than, 
the things it competes against. And that's what's taught in the design schools or the social science schools. All great breakthroughs need all three of those components. The, you know, the technical elegance, the perceived fair business model and the superior experience. And for that reason, the only thing that has actually worked in routinely delivering successful innovation are the firms that have done roll-ups of engineering firms, business capabilities, mostly consultant types and strategic planners and design types. Um, John Maida in his, uh, annual report that he was doing with, uh, KKR, um, uh, called design in tech was tracking this for many years until he recently left there and went to a different firm. So that piece of annual analysis has disappeared, but design in tech 2017 and design in tech 2018, both of which are easily available to any of your students or listeners, Greg on, on their Google machine. Uh, will, will show the very thorough analysis of the way the 71 top design firms in the world have all been hoovered up by either strategy firms, McKinsey, Booz, Bain, BCG, pr predominant among them, or the technology firms, Deloitte and Accenture, most prominent among them, but also Oracle, SAP, and Salesforce to the point where there are no large design firms left, but. If you and I can agree for purposes of this podcast, that a perfect execution, a mm -hmm. great world-class design team would have integrated team skills for technology, business, design, and social sciences. I think what we've just declared you and me in our friendly little confines of your podcast is that that's what victory looks like in the real world, that victory is complicated and compounded by the fact that you do it by acquiring firms. And then there's the whole issue of, can you keep the talent that you acquire? Can you build on the methods that you acquire? Can you mm -hmm. get them to respect each other and to be fully integrated and supported by the delivery models in the real world? Can you charge for that scale of team? And if you can't, then you end up trivializing your own capabilities and packaging them in some different way. And that's again, a, a really inherently difficult problem. The reason why big design firms are unstable is that they tend to be very, uh, um, hard hit by recessions. Companies should invest more during a recession in innovation, but they don't. They, the wagons and they get defensive if they were paying any attention to history and, 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 and actual data yeah. they'd go the opposite way. They would use those down. It is a thing. Yeah. It's the kind of thing you should be teaching at the great Haas business school. Yeah. That's um, always been this puzzling. This is the time to innovate right? it's, when it's, everybody around you is losing their yeah. head and scared and all the resources are effervescing away for God's sakes. Think about how to reinvent your category. It's the perfect time to do it. And at about the time. That yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of like taking up, you know, smoking, you know, when exactly. COVID hits, right? So you know, like you're you saying should, it you should be doing the opposite, clearly. right? Now's a good time Here's to start, you know, working out, point, right? Though. What we have done painstakingly in the 21st century is we've tried to tackle the real world problems of innovation, mostly by creating enormous focused firms, mostly through acquisition. What we haven't done is figured out how to get those talented teams to truly work together, to be truly integrated, to be effective at small scale and at fair market prices. So that reinforces the place you and I were chatting about maybe 40 minutes ago when you said, well, are big companies, you know, better at innovation than little companies or not big companies that can afford to hire an Accenture or Deloitte can do a okay job. But here's a fun fact to know and tell that not enough people think about 
I often am brought in to innovation units all around the world, inside of companies, inside of governments, and inside of consulting firms. And I'm asked to opine about them. And one of my little quiet things I do, Greg, probably won't be able to do it anymore after I reveal it as one of my techniques, is I try to get a sense of whether or not they've ever invented anything. And you'd be shocked at how often innovation units inside <laughs> of consulting firms or for that matter, innovation units inside of huge um, service organizations mostly talk to their clients about their processes. They'll say, well, this is the process you use now, but best practice would include this, this, and this. So we're going to charge you one and a half million dollars to install these other mm -hmm. capabilities. And they still leave the burden on the client organization to actually have an idea, go through all the steps to evaluate the idea, prototype the idea, develop the idea, tool mm -hmm. and manufacture and distribute, um, maybe do a couple of acquisitions around the idea, launch the idea, and then discover whether or not the dogs are going to eat the dog food well down the road. And I think it's sloppy, unprofessional, and inexcusable when an organization that says it's an innovation consulting firm can't point to a single thing it ever innovated and always talks process and never mm -hmm. talks, you know, we did this and we did this and we did this and we did this and everyone. Sure. But, but that isn't, that, isn't, that just, isn't that just because that they're, they want to teach the Kennedy client how to fish rather than giving them a fish? Isn't that sort of writer. what they're supposed to do? Um, um, but it's different than that, Greg. And here I'm going to, again, offend a number of smart people that have been exceptionally well-educated, some of them good friends of mine. I think innovation is so scary that the smartest people I know trained in the best schools that I know are very afraid to put their names next to something that they're recommending as, I think you should go build this. And I think this will change the world. And I think instead they can sell very profitably and over and over mm -hmm. and over again, process improvements. And so I think a savvy client. And if anybody on your podcast thinks of themselves, not as a budding consultant, but instead someone running a firm that wants to innovate, wants to get the very best work out of an innovation consulting team, listen, as they tell you that your processes are wrong, they're probably right about that and be curious about it and try to not make process mistakes because they really are going to hurt you over and over and over again, if you're not using the best available processes. But go past that and ask, okay, what should we do? And make sure your consultant sticks in the problem long enough to get some skin in the game. And if they don't, then the odds are they found the easy way to be an innovation consultant, not the hard way. Yeah, well, I think it, maybe it's because they're concerned about their reputation. I mean, as an academic, when I'm brought in by companies and they ask me, you know, what they should do, I just tell them, I say, you know, you should do this. Because if, if my advice does turn out to be really bad, you know, no one will know. So I'm not afraid to, well, for 40 I'm not years afraid I've to done, tell them what, what I think, I've rather I think if, if you're a consulting firm, you know, you, you don't want to have mud on your face, force right? myself to be an entrepreneur, thinking about scarce resources, not wanting to waste a dime, not wanting to make an error, understanding that I don't get to feed my kids if I screw up. And ask myself, okay, what should I go do now? And I try to bring that discipline to everything. But, you know, Greg, it's a little bit like baseball. These days, a really great baseball hitter, you know, gets maybe 300 hits out of a thousand at bats if you're really good. And, um, mm -hmm. and yet they don't find themselves humiliated and walking off the field. Similarly, again, so important to pay attention to metrics that matter. Global norms across all industries and all geographies is that 
four and a half out of every hundred initiatives return the cost of capital. That's a pretty pathetic batting average, isn't it? So no wonder people are scared to stick their necks out. But what I like to do is to force on the team that's doing the innovation, the opposite expectation. Nobody else in mm -hmm. the firm knows better than you do what to go build. So what are we going to commit to? What are we going to recommend? And how are we going to de-risk that? By the way, Greg, that four and a half percent global norm has a bell curve associated with it. And everyone should know where the norm is in their industries. So financial services does an awful lot better than the, than the norm. Um, the educational world is in the sub basement, mm -hmm. one of the worst. Shockingly, the toy industry is the absolute worst. I don't think it should come as a shock to any of your listeners that, that government <laughs> innovation is among the worst. I think we can see that every day, day in and day out with things mm -hmm. like the performance of Congress. Um, so understanding what I call the power level of innovation is for your industry, your, your vertical is one of the best starting places. How, what, what level of success do I have to hit in order to just not be falling behind companies like me? And you, you mentioned governments and nonprofits, and I know you've spent a lot of time in those areas. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's hard, it's easy to understand why those areas might be less innovative because there's, there's less pressure on them in terms of profitability. But on the other hand, there's, there's also less pressure in the form of stakeholders that are going to um, you know, fire them in Are the event of, of, of government or failure. So, so one would think that they could potentially take more risks. What's been your biggest governments and philanthropies, philanthropies in particular, uh, you know, they're often, if they're established philanthropies where they're not requiring additional incremental funding, you know, if you're a foundation that's been around for you know a couple decades, then, um, it seems like you know, risk-taking should be easier for you than it would be for a company that has to meet its, its quarterly, uh, you know, earnings for the analysts. So, so why then don't these philanthropies well, um, experiment more the reason aggressively? I asked you to be precise with, about with whether you're talking about philanthropies or governments is goals. because the conditions are wildly different in each of those. Yeah. Exactly. And democracy always takes longer. Governments have voters that <laughs> you know, throw them out, the throw special the candidates out. Coming to the um, it's very different in the last 15 years than it was prior to that. Um, I was privileged to do the 100th anniversary innovation plan for the Rockefeller Foundation. They hit their 100th anniversary in, uh, I think, 2015. Um, and I did the 100th anniversary innovation plan in 2013 for them working directly with the CEO and all of the program leaders. And, and the breakthrough that we developed turned out to be of such importance that Judith Rosen, their brilliant CEO, gave it away to the 20 other largest philanthropies in the world, a great and beautiful piece of generosity on her part. But what I think might be missing in your otherwise cogent assessment, Greg, is that by and large, philanthropies are getting a monopoly in the world's gnarliest problems, the ones that are literally invaluable in many cases. So they're asked, what do we do with things like corruption? What do we do with mm -hmm. things like the future of agriculture or the need to urgently decarbonize the world or the problems of trying to get young people in in governments that are literally broken down to have a robust 21st century education and some pathway to survivability. And I mm -hmm. think when you start there, when you realize that, you know, there's very few, uh, countries, including these days, sadly, the United States that are willing to take the burden on their own backs to solve those global problems that are pervasive and costly and nasty and, and don't stop at the, at the country borders, um, conveniently that, that, that is where the budgets for government stop. Right. So that's the starting place. You get the world's toughest problems. And then the question is, what do you do inside of a philanthropy to figure it out? 
turns out, and no one knew this until we were privileged to do this assessment for Judy, um, Judith, she calls herself, um, that there are four generic answers to that, to that question. And all philanthropies tend to pick one or at most two of those generic answers, but don't even know when they're choosing it. So in order, Greg, the four, and it's a progression is that when you really mm -hmm. start to understand a problem, you could spend a lot of money developing a field model for it, which Rockefeller foundation has been doing in things like smart growth and in smart agricultural strategies in sub-Saharan Africa for 50 years, they really have tried to understand each of those fields. The next thing, which is extremely popular with what I think of as unsophisticated philanthropies is point solutions. You may not know this, Greg, but in the wake of the dot-com success, mostly in the United States of America, in the last 15 years, there are about 96,000 new philanthropies that did not exist 15 years ago. Nearly all of them funded by a gazillionaire that from the dot-com era that conveniently mm. thinks that he or she is a genius. Mm. And that believes that the reason they succeeded in the dot-com era is because of their personal perspicacity and their unfettered genius and their ability to see things in a new and different way. So they tackle these insoluble problems with a point solution. And I'm sure this will surprise the heck out of you, Greg, but they get emotionally attached to some particular intervention mm -hmm. and they dump, you know, 10, 11, 12, 20, 30 million of their personal dollars on it only to discover after that, that their idea didn't work. And they spend usually 10 years screwing that up and blaming other people for their failure to execute. And when I was running it, this is the way I would have done it. This is how you screwed it up. And they think it's like a business and it almost never is. But occasionally you do get a point solution out of the tens of thousands that people create that actually produces a good outcome. Then the question is, what do you do? This is the third stage of great progress in philanthropy mm -hmm. to take that point solution and figure out how to scale it and make it super robust. That means you have to sort of design it so that it can be implemented even in the face of ignorance, misunderstanding, corruption, whatever, right? So. That's when you discover the brilliant work that won a Nobel Prize, the November for four last for Esther Duflo of using randomized controlled trials for uh, figuring out which philanthropic advances actually work properly and which ones do not. And then there's the fourth and final bucket, which is almost completely dominated by one philanthropy alone, which is the Gates Foundation. Let's hope it stays that way, despite the recent complications in the Gates marriage. But what they do more than anybody else and with greater discipline than anybody else is they look for a proven piece of efficacy. So they find the $2 uh, cocktail of vaccines from the Global mm -hmm. Alliance for Vaccine and Immunization that's already been through the robust training. They've been able to discover, for instance, that a $2 Vaccine cocktail, Greg, provably improves the IQ of every recipient by 42 points on average and provably lowers their lifetime health care costs by at least $35 in U.S. dollars equivalents. And at that point, Bill and Melinda Gates say it's a moral imperative to give it to every small child in the entire continent of Africa. Here's $2 billion, go do it. We've never had that before as a mechanism. That's brand new in the history of the world. And it is something the Gates Foundation deserves credit for. But those four buckets, what's the field model and the theories of change? What are the 10,000 point solutions? Which six to 10 of those are super robust? have proven efficacy and have been de, um, debugged enough so that you can actually figure out how to give vaccines in villages and not have the villagers be completely up in arms. And as we know from Heart of Darkness and, 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 uh, and the 
Apocalypse Now movie, hack off the arms of the children that just got a vaccine because they didn't understand, you know, what the healthcare workers were doing. I mean, just you would be shocked, Greg, at how often well-intentioned, thoughtful things being done in the philanthropic world mm -hmm. create these catastrophically sad outcomes. And that's, that's why it's a different problem than other innovation problems and a juicy one. And one of my favorites, because what I see is a growing number of problems at global scale that are being tackled with methodologies that are completely subscale, um, ineffectual, um, enthusiastically embraced, randomly funded and destined to waste, you know, decades that we really don't have for things like decarbonization. Well, I think that's a topic that you could continue to work on uh, and perhaps uh, convert into book form to supplement this book, which is still a classic many years later. Um, there's so many topics that we just scratched the surface of, which I hope we will uh, discuss in some of our later conversations. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Larry. Thank you so much for joining me. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.